is a collaboration um, in terms of bringing this to the United States um, first. Uh, but after this, it's going to SF Camera Works and then to San Diego State University Downtown Gallery. So it's really all three organizations that are making this possible in um, each in our own way, uh, including money. And so I'm just really grateful to our collaborators there and really uh, excited to see how it unfolds in each of those locations. And specifically want to thank the OSHA Foundation and Lens Culture Foundation who made this exhibition in particular possible for the traveling exhibition. And then here in Portland, the Leonian Foundation who has supported this exhibition and all of our artists honorarians who wouldn't be able to support our artists without us. So thank you for that. And then lastly, it was um, December, as you know, you may be receiving emails that say exciting things like, give now and we will be giving twice as much and things like that. So we do have a challenge from our board and friends. Uh, so every gift you make during December will be matched up to $10,200. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that is really, that is the efforts of a um, number of people, some of whom can give larger amounts and some of whom can give smaller amounts and that all totals came to $10,200. So we hope that um, you will be able to contribute to that as well. If you receive one of those emails, just go ahead and do it if you are able. And we thank you because um, we are quite literally in this space and sitting on these chairs with lights on and some heat and a screen and <laughs> et cetera because of your support. So thank you for that. Um, and then we'll just turn it over to Kevin. despise microphones, I'm going to warn you in advance, so if I start to do this, you just have to kind of look at me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I'm not big on the karaoke, as you can tell. Um, so yeah, so I'd also like to just follow up with a great thanks to Blue Sky Gallery for having us. Um, both myself and Steffi have known about Blue Sky for quite a long time. I've known Chris and Janet for a really long time, so it's it's a huge pleasure for all of us to be here. Um, and um, I want to thank Zemi and Lisa and Amanda. I also want to thank our hosts, Tom and Molly. And um, as we see, we have a special guest star with us tonight. So we hope that Fenya is going to just participate and have her own <laughs> say in her mother's work. And we'll see how it goes. So uh, Fenya and Steffi came over last night from Berlin. They just arrived last yesterday. She has oh, the day before. Okay. Yeah. And I've been here a couple days and Gohar got here last night. So but Gohar is in, in Boston, so she's not having jet lag. But the rest of us are having jet lag. But anyway, no. <laughs> so I mean this is really quite I also wanted again to thank Lens Culture. I wanna also thank um, Eastway, my boss, my bosses who allowed me to devote a lot of my time to this show. Um, three of the artists in the show are represented by East Wing, and so I appreciate that they let me do my own thing there. Um, this is going to be very casual. Uh, I started coming up with like a very formal, and then I just thought it was really boring, I'm not doing that. So um, we're just going to run different images here. Um, you're going to see some of the other artists, just like some, like very few, and then you'll just see the work of Lohar and Steffi but it's a number of projects. So it's the project you see here, but it's also other work of theirs. And that's mainly to give you an idea of the breadth of what they've done in the past. Um, and then later we can, you know, we can take questions and, um, you know, and at some point we may just turn it over to questions to the audience. Um, but, so if there's something you see and you want to know more about it, we can discuss that later. Um, I just want to give you a little background on myself. I'm originally from the U.S. I was born in California. I left um, I left the U.S. in 2000 and ended up in Ireland for 15 years, which was a complete surprise to me. I went there as an artist and I ended up a curator. So um, after running an art center quite like this in uh, the south of Ireland, uh, I had gone about as far as I could go and um, was invited to go and work in Dubai for a year. 
Um, initially it was open-ended, but I was running, I was working in East Wing, and um, now I live in Berlin, where I work remotely for the gallery. So I do a lot of curatorial projects, both for the gallery and out otherwise. Um, the way the exhibition came about was a colleague of mine, Beata Sabielska, who runs a gallery called Gallery Image in Aarhus in Denmark, knew that I had moved to Dubai and wanted me to uh, curate a show uh, about the Middle East, which I was sort of, I don't want to just do a show of Middle Eastern arts, what, you know, can I go further than that? And at that time, the, um, the migration into Europe became everyday news. It was a huge thing. It was probably the height of the, of the um, migration coming into Europe. And so I realized that we already had some artists working on that subject, but then I had met Steffi in, um, in Arles, in the south of France, oddly enough, she lives in Berlin, um, and I'd seen Gohar's work. And I just felt there was a great mix here of artists who not only were making documentary work about this event, but were also making impressionistic work. They were looking at the staging and theatrics um, to express something that's very deep in the, um, in the whole reason that people migrate, and that is to find a better life. And also this dilemma that happens to people where you are rejected. So in the case of Gohar's work, what do you do when the walls around you are literally the rocks surrounding you and your only ceiling is the sky? How do you, how do you show that using photography and not be documentary? The video work in the show, I, I highly recommend you spend some time with the video work because it does everything from show the power of a mobile phone and the need to have that to communicate with each other to one man's story of coming over on the boat, which is Gucci's story, which is Danny's work. Daniel Castro Garcia is new to the show. He was not in the Arho show. One of our artists stepped out of the show and, um, and Danny stepped in. Danny is the recipient of the W.G. Smith Award for 2017. So um, he's been living in Sicily and working with unaccompanied minors there for about two years and working on the project for a war 20, since 2015. So, um, and then George is originally from Boston, uh, whose work is back here. Um, George is originally from Boston. He um, moved, he's, he's of Lebanese descent. He teaches now in Qatar at UCU in, in, in Doha. And um, he also runs a residency program in Cairo. So the work that you see here is, is his reflections of seeing these young men who are living in these in between spaces. They're under bridges, they're on private beaches, they're living quite many of them to a single uh, apartment building. Um, so he's been looking at these impressions and we have some of his Polaroids in the back of that vitrine, which are like his sketches as he's going through, as he's making these portraits of these young men. Um, so you can see kind of the, what led up to these works that you see on the wall. And then of course, uh, Tanya, is Tony Habjuka is originally from Amman in Jordan. She grew up in Texas and um, now lives in Jerusalem with her husband and her two children. So she, she was in Amman working with these women who were either, um, they either lost their husbands and sons and brothers to the war or they're waiting for their husbands and sons to come back for them. They went on to Germany and Sweden and other places to, again, make a better life. But the only way then can communicate with each other is through the mobile phones. So she saw this when one of the children was getting quite fussy and the mother held the mobile phone and there was a lullaby that the father was singing on the phone. And then she, was, she just said, okay, this has to be part of this body of work. And so again, I, I highly recommend that you spend some time with those videos because it's a single experience. So you, you're not sharing that screen with numerous people. It's just you having that very one-on-one -on -one experience with their stories, with the sounds of the children. The children are saying the things that the children, that children say. You know, Daddy, bring me back a pink dress like my friends down the street. And where are you now? Are you in Germany? Are you in Sweden? These are places they can't even conceive of. But the, 
really important point for me in bringing this show together was to kind of try to address the ignorance that people think that 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 I, you know the general public may have about what a migrant is and why a migrant or a refugee leaves their hometown. It's not because they want to. I mean, Gucci says a very interesting thing in the documentary where he says, I can explain the mentality of a, of a migrant to you. Put a cat in a room, give them no food, no water, and leave them there for a few days. Eventually the cat is gonna realize the window's open and he's gonna go out the window. So of course you're gonna leave, even if the house is comfortable. If there's no food, no water, no way to live, you have to leave. It's not a choice. And I think all of these works illustrate that in one way or another. For Steffi, she was actually born in a placement uh, facility. It was like a housing estate for people who had come from Poland. And her mother is um, of Ger German descent, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But so she was brought up in a place like that. So to go back, I felt, you know, she didn't go back to the place, the exact place where she grew up, but she went to something similar. And so she already had that affinity with those young people and that sense of waiting. They were only supposed to be in the camp for three years. Many of those kids have been there their entire lives. So it's their home and it's not their home. They've been there for 15 years. They're only supposed to be there three years. Um, Gohar has a experience herself with being in Iran and growing up during the Iran-Iraq war. But um, also, all of us, I think, myself included, you know, we moved around a bit. So there is that sense of how do you, you know, how do you mix, how do you fit in, how do you feel in a different culture? Or in my case, when you've left your culture and then you go back, like when I come back to the US, it takes a lot of adjusting. You know, it, it's changed, things have changed. I've been away now 19 years, and, and how do you experience that? So with all of that, that's, that's the thinking behind the show. Um, so I, I wanted us to have a little conversation and a bit of a party here with some grapes and a few other things. Um, we brought our toys, so that's good. Um, just to talk to the girls a little bit about their own, um, their own experience, what, what came out, how did their work come about, um, and just, just kind of have a chat. So um, I think maybe if you can, maybe we'll start with Gohar a little bit and just talk about why did you decide to go to this place? And maybe kind of put it in context of what, what you have been doing before. Thank you for all of you, and a special thanks to Blue Sky Gallery and amazing team. Thank you, Lee Whitehead. It's really a chance for artists to talk to the audience about their work. Um, the state was serious that you can see four piece in this gallery. And you can see all of the photos, there are eight photos in the catalog. Uh, the idea came when, you know, it was... <laughs> I just thinking about the meaning of the home or identity. When, when you just... You know, when I talk about the home, you have an imagination, maybe some small, or even you remember your family, or a street, or, you know, or city, but you just can imagine that uh, you don't have it. And it's like the people living in the airport, they don't, they don't have any bag, they don't know what's happening in the future, and just maybe the nature can help them. And uh, what I want is, it just, was the idea, and I tried to find a location as belong to nowhere. It's like they, we don't know as you know where they are and what they are doing. Is it exactly that happened? And our perspective about the people have to go out from the country, but we don't know what they are doing now. So I went to Daesh Island. Is it the location that I took this series in Persian Bull? And I found the location as part of Iran, but as not referred to Iran. And I love this specific, you know, the idea. And you can, as you can see in all of the photos, as the people trying to find the root in the nature. And the, the name of the project 
explain the project, the stateless, and it's like they're trying to, you know, find a home in nowhere. Is it the general idea? But all of my work is really personal and back to my life and how I grew up. I grew up in a city that the war happened between Iran and Iraq and Afghans. And so the war was eight years. And my father decided to stay there. I don't and still I don't know why he decided. And so because it was, you know, really the city that a lot of bomb every day from you know Saddam, but my father said, is it my city and I have to stay if I leave, okay, as as a different life. Anyway, we stayed there and I was kids and I didn't understand the meaning of the war, but it's like in my background, you go to school and a lot of normal life happens, go to the birthday party or wedding party, but it's like the war is, you know, in your life and you grow up with this situation. It's the, it's the meaning also is that like, you don't have a future, you, not, you live in a war zone, but you try to leave. It's like the, even the war cannot stop the leave, you know, the power of the living. It's the concept yet you can see in all of my work. In the slideshow, some piece of the Iran title that I did before Stateless Serious, and, and also you can see the project that I did last year, Home Serious. All has a connection with the meaning of the home and identity. And now I live in Cambridge, and sometimes I'm in Tehran, and still I don't know where I'm living. I mean mentally, uh, it's like you're trying to find your roots. Even when I back to Iran, I think I lost something. And it's that, you know, Tim that always, it's not a trouble for me <laughs> when I work with that. Um, I think a big part of the show that, that we wanted to touch on as well is this idea of citizenship. Why don't you, you know, like when, I, I one of my colleagues lives in, um, in Syria and at one point I said, you know, will you move over till this is over? And he's like, no, I'm, that's my city. I'm not leaving my city. And he also made a lot of work with other people where they were, that had stayed. So it's that idea of citizenship and it's something that we take for granted. Um, living in the U.S. or you know, if we live in certain parts of Europe, it's we we are able to stay there. But if you have no citizenship, if you have no papers, where does that leave you? Um, I was actually going to ask Steffi a little bit about that because we we discussed the idea of, of the young people that you've been working with in Germany and how losing the papers was kind of a freedom. Can I? Let you talk about your work a little bit. Yes. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. So um, everything um, started with uh, the, um, finding the, um, the the theme, the topic for my um, graduation, and it's like we had um, for the um, school one year time to work on this topic. So I find okay, this is a big chance, and I really have to do something. Um, what's in my interest, but it's not so easy to find what you really want. And I remember um, the one place I lived very nearby, so like just 40 kilometers away from my hometown. And uh, my ex-boyfriend uh, went there to take his fingerprints because he was like illegal, so undocumented. And we tried to get asylum for him. And I remember I was 19 and we entered this camp and I was like shocked. I mean, I live very near to it and I never saw something like that and I have, I have no idea about this. So, and it was really like hidden and in the end of the, um, like in the nowhere, in the middle of Germany. And then I remembered this town and I thought, okay, maybe that's worth to spend one year there taking pictures and to tell the story of the people. And also then I realized it's the it's a kind of very um, same camp I um, 
I get born. Um, so it was like a fun kind of circle. Um, lots of the youngsters who grow up there, um, they also uh, get born there. They get born with one um, document um, named Tolerated, and that is the worst case you can get in Germany. It's, um, it's no permission to stay, it's just um, um, temporary residency and um, every three months you have to ask for a new um, to, um, document. And I found people there in the camp who live since 15 years in this permanent um, uh, limited um, state. And this really makes something with your with your heart and with your brain. And this, um, the children like, grow up there and um, they don't, they, this is their home, their real home. They don't know the home country of their parents. And um, they know that Germany doesn't take them as a real, um, like, real documents. They go to German schools, they speak German, but they are not tolerated. And I thought this is really, uh, I have to, to show this um, because the most people uh, don't know what's in their neighborhood and they always look to other countries um, but this is uh, next to them and I mean that's our new generation and our future of the children so um, yeah I, and also I focused on the children because they are very multi Yes, and they spoke <laughs> German, and they, um, the uh, all the subjects um, not. So for me, it was easier to speak with them. And I mean, they also some of them speak very well English, and they couldn't understand my English. <laughs> 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 uh, was that your question? Yeah, I mean, it was just to get an idea because I remember when we when we sat down like for a month. when we sat down together before we made this trip. You, uh, you were telling me about how losing papers, like that was the way to, that that was a big part of it, that you know, if you were, were stuck, you would just lose your papers. Like tell you about being paperless was a kind of, not freedom, that's not the word, but it's just kind of what they had to do to survive. Yeah, you mean the story of Arthur? Yeah. Okay. Um, There's a picture of a girl named uh, Rima, uh, she's seven years old and she grew up in the camp and um, she has an older brother uh, named Apple and he's also in the slideshow and um, he was 16, 15 when I met him and I spent lots of time with his family and I also slept in the um, children's room and everybody, even his parents and his uh, sister named him Apple and they were um, Armenians from Syria. Um, after three years, I made um, a dinner and the youngsters came to my home and he said to me, hello, I'm Rafik. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, um, now my parents said the truth to the government and we are not from Syria, we are um, from Armenia and we were witness of a murder. So that's why we left our home country, but we were so scared to tell the truth. And everybody tells us we have to say other reasons and we have to say we are from Syria because then we have better chances to get asylum. So, and this family was really like, if you entered the room, uh, the home, you felt this big depression. The parents were so sad and I always felt they were like, it was really hard to be there, even when they were very friendly and I never could get it. And after um, that, uh, when Rafik told me the, the real story and they really had to change their identity and their names and um, their, their age, everything they changed and their, their whole family story and they even get a, um, a, a truth, a Wirklichkeit. So uh, that's uh, Rima, that's the sister of him. Um, she has the real name because she <laughs> get born there, yes. But um, he and his sister and the daughters like, live with a uh, wrong identity. And that makes really a lot with, uh, with the human. Uh, 
der originally der Christians from Armenia. Yeah, but they said Zurich because at this time Zurich was like everybody from Zurich is immediately papers and can leave the camp. That, and who stays in the camp are uh, like Roma people from um, from Africa, um, up from Afghanistan, um, yeah, Serbia. They are really like stuck into this situation. Mm -hmm. Nobody's interesting in them. It's like. Yeah, and it's like there, there was also war, or is still war now. Yeah. yeah, but it's not in the newspapers. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if anybody out in the audience has any questions. There's a hand up in the back. We don't have a real big mic, unfortunately. Uh, it's closer. Okay. Um, so this is specific to anyone who's been practicing in Syria or Iraq. Gohar, you spoke about Iraq. I'm sorry, Iran. Iran. Um, it, there's a big concern about Yemen right now is the biggest humanitarian disaster on earth right now. It, even in comparison to the Rohingya massacres in Myanmar. So this is the big one. Is in that in that we've been talking about immigration and duress and difficult humanitarian situations. Um, when in the places that you travel, Gohar, and maybe I generalize this to the rest of you, is there, is there conversation about Yemen? It, does it spill over into the awareness of people that are traveling possibly in their own state of duress? Is there, does the news leak in that there's horrors going on not that far away? You mean uh, the people talk about the Yemen situation? Mm -hmm. It's like here, you read the news. Yeah. If okay. you want it exactly with Iranian perspective, you read it with American perspective. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we read the news in Iranian with Iranian perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? This is your chance. Anybody have a question? Otherwise, I'll just keep blabbering. Okay, Janet. <laughs> Can you talk a little more about these images? So, that are these people who were there in this place, or did you bring people to? Yeah, tell me a little bit about the making of them. I usually I work with a team as my big process. I have two assistants, two advisor. You know, some people still the mic to help me about the project. But this is specific series because I did in the island, a little bit far from Tehran, we was very small, you know, we were very small group. Me and my husband, then all of them work with my husband, and uh, one assistant. So, and the people are model, uh, the stage photography, you know, some of them are local, some of them are, you know, professional model from Tehran and just came and I paid for them themselves. So. It depends. Uh, if you're asking technically how is the process. The process is I found a location. I went to Fish, I think 10 or 12 times to find the exact location that I want. And after that, I, because I sketch everything when I want to start the project, and I know what I wanted with, for instance, about the first piece, the mother and the daughter. And so I tried to find a photo for, from this specific piece. And I was lucky because that time one of the famous Iranian filmmaker made a movie in Daesh Island. Oh. Ever, you know, yeah. And so and his team really helped me. Mm. And some of them are actor or actress of the movie that came to my <laughs> Yeah. So it's uh, and the idea about, you know, maybe I can speak about this, you know, the first piece. When I wanted to do that, and the mother is like, put the hand and the eyes of the daughter. What I wanted to, you know, write and, you know, and paint what I want to do in that location. I remember when I was to daycare, I was four years old. 
and it, when my daycare was behind of the one of the biggest hospital in in Athens, the city that the war happened. And every day when I wanted to pass the hospital, I just usually go with my dad because it was close to my dad always. My father put his hand in my eyes, uh -huh. and I thought it is a game, and I didn't know is it something happened because every day they bring a lot of dead body, you know the hospital, and when we wanted to arrive, I asked my dad, Daddy, put your hand in my eye, because I thought it was a game, but it was not a game. And so, it, you know, it, it's, it's a, when I said all of the work is very personal, it's like, you know, something comes to, you know, what happened in my life. And when I, at first, I decided just standing together and look at what happened behind, when, you know, when I told, okay, we can put the, uh, you know, put the hand in the eyes, that time I didn't think about this happened in my childhood. But after the one I got, oh, it is that, that's what the connection yeah. is. Yeah. 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 When you were working with the kids in Saarland, did you feel, because, I mean, in your situation growing up, it was quite a different situation and in some ways the same, did you feel a, uh, uh, kind of synergies with those kids? Like, uh, did you connection. relate to them connection? Um, or was it totally different? It, it was just uh, um, the personal. It's like it, you can take a picture of somebody you don't like, and this was my personal work, so I just worked with people I really we have a special connection. So I visited lots of families, and uh, often I broke up after a few days because I felt there's no connection between us. And um, I followed families, and I always knock on the door, <laughs> some <laughs> sweets for the kids, and um, like, which I really like, um, liked. And the families always. Um, Asked me to have a tea with them and to share food, and, um, and yeah, I was very um, near to uh, to my subjects. I really like had friendships with them, and um, I, I spent so much time with them. I, I, I slept in their rooms and we ate together, and they taught me a lot. And we just had fun. I mean, at the one picture where Sanya gets ironing her hair. That was my day off because I was really like my finger was like uh, <laughs> so tired. And it's digital this work. I started with analog, but then I realized this is, has no sense. Inside it's very dark, and outside it's very bright, and the children are just jumping from inside to outside, and no way. So, um, and this was my day off, and I put the camera. Um, I think it happened to the kitchen of the parents, and uh, we wanted to go um, ice skiing. And I waited just for Sanya and her uh, sister. They were like dressed up because it was like boys and girls together without the parents. And, and then I knocked on her door to take her. And it was like, Sanya, where are you? I'm waiting. We are waiting for you. And she's just like, get iron. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, where's my camera? <laughs> Yeah. 
So they are aware, completely aware of their situation. They, the um, parents try to hide their, um, and to, to have normal life, daily life, but the children realize that they, it's not like their um, classmates with the, the same future. Um, so in the camp they have a kind of brotherhood or sisterhood because they are all from abroad and they can be, they are strong together um, and the Germans are like a little bit stupid. So the, the first question to me was always, are you a German? And uh, so like, you can be nice if you are a German. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, but uh, that's life. Um, <laughs> And they are, I have contact with them, and Sanya has now her third child with 18, and her sister had one child and um, skipped the father. And Rafik is uh, doing a school for to get um, a hairdresser, and um, Nima goes to school and we, everything um, is um, depends on the parents. If they can give their children um, belief and strongness in the future, and to say you go to school and you will do it and you can do it, or if they just have no interest in the children's future, it's really everything the parents. But is there a is there a pathway for them to get legal status? Ah, yes. Um, if uh, with work, everything works with money in Germany. So oh. if you get the permission to work, and it's really hard to get it, but you can get it if you are like stubborn and ask all the time for it. Please, not now. Um, <laughs> then you get the chance uh, for the work permission, and if you. Um, earn enough money for your family, then you have the chance to get the permission. But it's not always, and it's complicated, and in some cases yes, and in some cases not. And it's um, the whole time you have to deal with the lawyer, and um, with the government, it's like you go to the next trial. It's like always. Um, and the, the, but the kids are used to it. And if you get the yellow envelope, then you know this is that you that there's the letter that your family is get, getting sent back. And um, <coughs> the news are always like, did someone get deported this night? It's like every day this question: which family gets sent back? Um, but some families really don't get the permission because they are stubborn and they are strong and they go every day to the government and they get help also from other <coughs> German um, institutes. But it's really, there's no line that's, yeah. I just wanted to say really quickly about Danny's work too, that those lads in those pictures, they came over without their parents. So they are given a place to live, but no activities and no schooling. Eventually they do, I don't know what the process is, but they are finding jobs in other countries and he's gonna follow them as they go on to these other countries. So that's been another chapter of his work. But I think that's been the most disheartening thing for him is watching these young people come over who are, I mean, he said, you know, you have to envision a town in Sicily where overnight 400 young men um, from Africa are just dropped into this town and what, what happens to the town and what happens to those boys, but it's that idea of how do you get access to the things that are gonna make you a stronger grown-up in the long run. But sorry, there was other question, yeah? Um, yeah, you were talking about documents, and documents are life and death for a refugee or a survivor or a genocide survivor, and the, the Rohingyas were stateless people Love to go back, but they know the place they left is not there anymore. 
so they continue to go forward and deal with, the, with what's in front of them as opposed to going back to what they know. Uh, Steffi, uh, can, can they be sent back after they've been in Germany for like 10 years? Yes, of course. Can you repeat it for people? Um, yes, uh, with being tolerated, you can send every three months when this paper is, um, after the three months when it's, um, when it's ending, then you get sent back. So you really live in this permanent insecurity uncertainty um, and it's, um, it's very sad. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think in the slideshow, Gohar's photographs of the sort of uh, grass on the, in the buildings. I mean, there aren't any in this, but I've actually seen them in another exhibition that I saw in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, can you talk about that work, even though I guess you, you can see them come up on the screen occasionally. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now you're going to be in faster. Yes, 
uh, called the uh, Schmitz, like the Smiths in English. Um, it's a very common name, and uh, that's the name of this family. It's um, about Alexandra and her two children, Aminata and Ujuru. Um, she's a single mother. Her father also lives in Berlin, um, and she's from Sierra Leone, and also has a, he has a permission, I think, always for one year because he has two children in Germany, so they can send him back. But he is really not um, often there. And Alexandra deals with a really um, hard um, depression, and she's half of the year really not, not really there. She's like more absent than there. So um, Aminata, the older girl, takes the uh, the role of the motherhood, or of the, the strong girl. And it's like, just to work, I just followed this family. I, I met Alexander, we had this uh, at school, we should just make a portrait of somebody we don't know. And I met her and I was immediately in, interest, interested in her and um, they led me inside their world. Um, that, that was interesting for me. It's a modern family, like a single mother, and they live from, um, from the government, so it's also child poorness. And uh, yeah, it's here. Can you maybe go? Yeah, okay. So the mother and the two children, and it's a, it's a mixed family, and you have like mental issues, and uh, a father who isn't there, and they are also like. Um, He's, she's a German and he's from Africa, and, but the children are German. And um, the girl gets burned with six years. She was like playing with candles, and I mean, the mother was at this time um, not in a good situation. And uh, Aminata is now more in my uh, interest because she's really like um, very, very strong. Um, and it's also the love between the family because uh, it's really, yeah, it's, it fascinates me. Um, um, yeah. and the reason I included that body of work was to also illustrate a little bit more of beyond this, what's, what you can see in the room that, that uh, both of what Gohar and Steffi has done. And I think, again, it's this empathy, it's this connection that Stephanie ma Steffi makes with her subjects. The image of um, the young girl that's burned, when she first showed that to me, um, we were talking about, it was about the, the body work was going to be about kind of that depression, but then when I saw how strong the daughter is, so it's actually her story, you know, so the mother's story, it's her story. And although she was burned, that is not, that's, it's not like uh, taking her over, it's, she's just continued. But uh, this is this is a work in progress. The mm -hmm. title is The Schmitz. Yeah, it's, what are you calling the book now? It's The, the Schmitz, it's the German name. Schmitz. Like the I mean, is that the last name? Yes, yeah, the last yeah. name. Yeah. Yeah. So you're seeing her get older, you know, and then since uh, Fenya was born, she's just now starting to go back to them a little bit at a time. But it's, I mean, it's a very hard project. It's like she said, you know, dealing with the families, with the, with the adults in the families, in the toleration work. Um, it's very hard for her to go and, and be in that room. Because I know you told me, going, finding it, she knows when it's her birthday and you bring her presents and her mother What's the situation when you go when it's her birthday? You were telling me that story last time. Uh, um, that the mother kind of was still in bed. Um, yeah, I mean, the mother is really like, um, she's very intelligent, she's very sensitive, and she knows about the situation very well. And, uh, but it's like, um, for the children, they are already used to it. And that's the sad thing. They are used to it to hide the situation at school. They are used to it to say, my mother is fine. I just have, don't have a, trou a second trouser when it's raining at school. And they are hiding it. And um, when it's Christmas, she more, um, mostly um, every Christmas she's uh, sick. Mm -hmm. So um, when I go there, then 
it's really like more sad and the kitchen is really like a mess and I clean up and uh, we cook together and it, that's also part of the work because we get very close and uh, friends and uh, uh, it's not easy to deal with somebody with a depression for me it's really like really a very very worse uh, disease and also in our society often the single parents are not they are not supported by the government and also not the society and also child homeless in a well very developed country is like we don't have it but we have it and in a big city like Berlin uh, so this is really a modern family for me and it's a, it's a problem uh, so I don't want to I just want to say show the people that this is happening and maybe your neighbors are having this problem, just knock on the door. And yeah, but I'm also not a doctor. And she always wants me to be her doctor, but I'm not. Um, yes. I think this raises a really big issue for photographers of knowing when to draw that boundary. I mean, I've worked with a lot of artists throughout the years that have gotten embedded into different communities. Um, many of those communities had very specific problems and the guilt that they felt walking away from that, I mean, that's what Danny's going through right now. He's starting to, his partner, who's also a producer on the project, she's gotten pregnant and they're gonna go back to the UK and it's really a difficult moment for him because he doesn't know exactly what's the right time and now he's sort of in a position where he has to, um, to pull back. And I worked with Doug Dubois in Ireland for four years where he worked with a small community there and it was very hard for him to go, okay, I'm done. I'm actually not coming back next summer to work with you again and having to communicate that to the, the people that he's been photographing for so long because you do become their friends. You do become a part of their life. But I know that for Steffi this has been really difficult because you can see the power of the daughter and you want to support that, but yet, you know, and, and I'm sure the son as well, but it, you also have to take care of yourself. Yes. And that's a huge issue. I didn't take any other. I, I took her sometimes, but um, I, I knew it's a mess there inside and I didn't know where to put her when she yeah. was smaller. So I really didn't photograph her the last one and a half years. I, I couldn't, um, but now she's in the Kita and <laughs> I can start again. <laughs> Alexander uh, just bought me an SMS, like, good luck in America, and uh, she's now feeling better, and that's always um, easier to work with, because in the depression it's really, like, hard, and I prefer when you can speak with your subject. <coughs>
um, the family broke up. They, they, the father came home, started beating on the mother, and the kids ran away. And so they were in, the kids were all put into care, and he came back, and he was very like, oh, I'm gonna go anyway and show them pictures. I'm like, okay, you gotta be careful now, because now the, um, now the government is involved, and you're a 40-odd-year-old man, 50-odd-year-old man, taking pictures of young people whose parents are having troubles. So he, he went through the right, I'm not gonna make this really short, he went through the right uh, way of approaching one of the girls through the, the foster mother, and the foster mother gave permission, and he went and he showed her pictures, because he had pictures to give her, so he gave them to the, the daughter, and everything was fine, and the next day they had a supervised visit, and the daughter brings these pictures and shares them with the family, and social services said, wait a minute, who's this 50-year-old guy taking pictures of you? And why, and, and they turned to the parents and said, did you know about this? And of course, they got freaked out because they didn't want to lose the kids, and they were like, no, we didn't know about it at all. So then I had to go with them to social services. You know, so there's that whole, you know, just to talk about, you know, the idea of, of being a photographer and how do you, and he, fortunately, he, he's really good friends with Jim Goldberg, so they talked about it. But he was a little ostracized from the neighborhood for a while, but he was eventually re, um, he was welcomed back. And I mean, the minute they knew he'd gone down to social services, everybody closed their door to him. And he didn't, he hadn't done a thing, you know? So it's that thing of, yeah, you get yourself into these very, difficult situations where you're really, you're welcomed because you're giving them a voice, but then you can also be shut out. And then if you leave, you can also be seen as betraying because you're not here anymore. You're not, why aren't you telling our story anymore? But you've also got to have your own life, you know? Yeah, so not to go, not to digress, but I think that's really an important issue when you're dealing with these kinds of um, stories. But, I, but as Chris says, I think it's really vital in this show in particular, that, and especially in the times that we're living in, where people are being, you know, fingers are being pointed all the time to say that, you know, it's really not the case in, in most of the stories. You know, that people just want what you and I and everybody else wants. We all want a safe place to live. We want to be able to feed our kids. We want to give them a life of some sort, you know, and not have to live where bombs are on or where the climate has taken the land away. So is there any other questions? I think we're about ready to round this up, so. Anybody else? Yeah, I really want to thank you all for coming. I'm going to thank the girls for being here. I want to thank Ben and for being here. We'll be around if you want to chat with us. And again, thank you so much for your time and your attention. Thank you.